It is a story that is more relevant today than when it was released nearly 40 years ago. Not because it's a story about finding a way to persevere when all hope is lost. That is timeless. No, it's because at its core is the belief that one person can make a difference for themselves, for their community, heck, for the universe, by being really good at video games. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of The Last Starfighter. Thank you to KiwiCo for sponsoring this video. Go to KiwiCo.com slash ToyGalaxy to get 50% off your first month of any crate right now. KiwiCo is defining the future of play by making it engaging, enriching, and seriously fun. They create super cool hands-on projects and toys designed to expose kids to concepts in STEAM. That's science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Each monthly crate is designed by experts and tested by kids and teaches a new theme through hands-on learning and fun. KiwiCo now offers nine subscription lines, each catering to different age groups and topics. A unique gift idea for kids and adults. Each box comes with all the supplies needed for that month's project, so no extra runs to the store. Detailed, easy-to-follow instructions and an educational magazine filled with content to learn even more about the crate's theme. KiwiCo believes that by learning the skills to problem solve, innovate, and create, kids can truly change the world of tomorrow. The projects provide hours of entertainment and something to show for your investment and time and the investment in your child or yourself. KiwiCo now ships to more than 40 countries. Click the link in the description below now to get 50% off your first month of any crate by going to kiwico.com slash toy galaxy. Again, that's kiwico.com slash toy galaxy. And thank you again to KiwiCo for sponsoring this video. The Last Starfighter is a 1984 feature film directed by Nick Castle, written by Jonathan Betchel, starring Lance Guest, Robert Preston, Dan O'Herlihy, and Catherine Mary Stewart. It asks the question, what if Star Wars was neither a long time ago nor far, far away? Trapped in a life he didn't ask for, Alex Rogan dreams of being anywhere else so he can be someone. Someone who did something with their life. Someone who made a difference. Because life at the Starlight Starbright trailer park is as dead end as it can be. Alex and his younger brother Lewis live with their mother who does what she has to to keep food on the table, pulling double duty as the manager of the trailer park and waiting tables at the diner in town. Recently graduated from high school, with his schedule wide open, Alex inherits the maintenance responsibilities of the trailer park. While his friends go have fun, he has to spend all day plunging people's toilets and patching Miss Elvira's electric connection so she can watch her soap operas. But he's got plans, you'll see. While his girlfriend Maggie and the other grads spend their time hanging out at the drive-in and settle for City College in the fall, he's applied for a bank loan to go to university, a bigger school far, far away from this nowhere tumbleweed town. In the meantime, his only escape is an arcade game called Starfighter, a space war POV shooter stand-up arcade unit located at the small grocery store at the top of the hill. Starfighter puts players in command of a Gunstar spaceship hurtling through space, blasting enemy fighters. It calls player to adventure with the opening narration, Greetings, Starfighter. You've been recruited by the Star League to defend the frontier against Xur and the Kodan Armada. Get ready, prepare for blastoff. It is this very arcade unit that sets his destiny into motion. After setting the new high score in a brief celebration with the residents of the trailer park, he is brought back down to earth by the revelation that his school loan has been denied. Grief-stricken for the loss of the future he thought was in his grasp, fate presents another opportunity to go further and make a bigger difference than he ever could have imagined. Responding to a signal sent out from the record-breaking game of Starfighter, an alien named Centauri arrives in a flying space car. This time, the recruitment pitch is real, not to play a game, but to actually step up as a Starfighter and defend the galaxy against Xur and the evil Kodan Armada, to join forces with pilots chosen from all over the cosmos, to hold the line at the frontier, a massive of space shield that protects the peaceful planets of the Star League. Things change, always do. Alex Rogan's chance has come. Will he grab it with both hands and hold on tight? Is he ready to leave his unremarkable earthbound life to live his dreams and explore a fate among the stars? The Last Starfighter was conceived and written by Jonathan Betchul while working as a junior copywriter at an advertising agency in New York in the early 80s. He too would escape the daily grind by checking out the video games at the local arcade. Or by reading books like 1958's The Once and Future King by T.H. White, the story of Arthur fulfilling his destiny to become king after pulling the sword from the stone. 
or by reading the screenplays his wife would bring home from her film studies classes. Those scripts whet his appetite for a new kind of storytelling. In an interview with Yahoo Movies in 2015, Betchel said, quote, with screenplays I became enamored with the format of conveying the most information in the least amount of words, and yet making it colorful and descriptive and vivid. Betchel spent two weeks writing his version of a King Arthur story reimagined for the first generation of video gamers, battling space invaders here on Earth and out there in space. Producer Gary Adelson and Lorimar Pictures purchased the script and brought in Nick Castle to direct. Nick Castle didn't have a lot of experience, but he had directed a low-budget film called Tag the Assassination Game in 1982, written Escape from New York in 1981, and starred as The Shape or Michael Myers in Halloween in 1978. The film was shot in the hills of Santa Clarita, California to give it a more isolated setting than other popular science fiction films that were set on Earth, E.T., Close Encounters of the Third Kind, movies that took place in the suburbs. Steven Spielberg had established a blueprint for grounding these otherwise fantastic stories. Castle and company wanted to avoid those comparisons, but you know, a kid living in isolation, fantasizing about escaping the responsibilities of his day-to-day -day existence, postponing his dreams while maintaining the family business, being called by destiny to fight in a star war, also sounds familiar. Ultimately, all Castle and company could do was focus on telling their own story their own way, knowing that comparisons were not only unavoidable, but inevitable in this genre. Where The Last Starfighter could establish its own identity was in their depiction of space battles. The timing of the production gave them the opportunity to bring visuals to the screen unlike anything moviegoers had ever experienced before, and producer Adelson wanted to take that shot. Movies like Star Wars, Star Trek, Close Encounters, The Black Hole, TV shows like Battlestar Galactica, Buck Rogers had already pushed practical visual effects to their limits. The use of models and miniatures combined with moving camera systems, matte paintings, and green screens to depict spaceships and laser fights were commonplace and expected. The last Starfighter employed plenty of practical effects like a drivable version of Centauri's space car, the beta unit's early stages where it's replicating Alex's appearance or when it removes its own head, makeup for the Kodans and Rylands, a full-scale set for the Star Command headquarters and the interior of the Gunstar. The last Starfighter considered that same approach for the scenes in space, but pivoted to emerging technology. Only one movie, Disney's Tron in 1982, had attempted to utilize computer-generated imagery for a substantial amount of their visual effects, and while two years is isn't a long time in general, it was plenty of time for the technology to begin to mature. The world of Tron is literally inside a computer, and the primitive state of CG helped to sell that strange, unexplored environment. However, the process to create the effects was closer to traditional cell animation, with individual frames being generated and then composited with footage of actors. Unlike Tron, The Last Starfighter didn't want to create a world that looked like it existed inside a computer. They wanted to create and fully render a world that looked like it was real, but only existed inside a computer. All it would take was money and time. Digital Productions was a company founded by Gary Demas and John Whitney Jr., two effects pioneers that helped develop the CG effects for Tron. They had been developing software, hardware, and processes for integrating computer imagery into films faster and more affordably as technology evolved. Early samples in their portfolio included pitching the use of computer-generated effects for The Empire Strikes Back and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The Last Starfighter would be their opportunity to demonstrate that this kind of imagery was no longer theoretical. It could be budget-conscious, and it could look good on a giant screen. Other industry effects expertise came in the form of production designer Ron Cobb, who created the Gunstar and Kodan spaceships, among other designs. Cobb had worked on Star Wars, Alien, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Conan the Barbarian. Cobb played a big part in convincing Adelson and Castle that all of the space scenes could be done using CG effects, although he admits that most of his confidence and enthusiasm came from the confidence and enthusiasm of Demas and Whitney Jr. None of them were totally sure that it would work or that they had enough time to do it. What they had was the money to purchase a brand new state-of-the-art Cray XMP supercomputer, and roughly six months to hire and train the staff to create the digital images while simultaneously rendering out the scenes. Because the volume of polygons they were going to have to push around was going to take months to render with the level of realism they were looking to achieve. The reality was that no one was actually going to know what the shots would look like until it was almost too late to change them. They didn't have to do it this way. They didn't have to become pioneers in digital effects technology. Destiny didn't choose them. They chose Destiny. They rose to the challenge in defiance of the numbers because it had never been done before, and they had a chance to be the first. He thought it was just a video game. For the best, my boy. Until the impossible happened. Welcome to Rylos. I believe this. He could be the greatest starfighter ever. Victory! 
I've always wanted to fight a desperate battle against incredible odds. It'll be a slaughter. Robert Preston, Lance Guest. Here we go. Charge! The science fiction action thriller, The Last Starfighter. The cast was anchored by newcomer Lance Guest. At 23 years old, he was still relatively believable as a somewhat recent high school grad. More importantly, he had a unique charm, as if Christopher Reeve and Paul Rudd had a baby. For The Last Starfighter, he pulled off dual roles as Alex and a Beta unit, essentially a robotic clone of himself. Test audiences responded so positively to his performance as Beta unit Alex that more scenes with the character were added during reshoots after he had already cut his hair, which explains the terrible wig. Centauri, the intergalactic talent scout, a fast-talking hustler, always working his angle, always looking to get paid, was played by Robert Preston, practically reprising his role as Harold Hill, the fast-talking hustler, always working his angle from the 1957 stage production and 1962 Warner Brothers musical, The Music Man. Alex's reptilian partner in the Gunstar Grig is played by future OCP executive and Robocop's dad, Dan O'Hurley. Alex's girlfriend, Maggie, is played by Catherine Mary Stewart. They are joined by Norman So as Zur, Chris Hebert as Lewis Rogan, and Vernon Washington as Otis. Science fiction novelist the Honorable Alan Dean Foster wrote a novelization published shortly after the film's release in 1984. That same year, Marvel Comics produced their own adaptation written by Bill Mantlo with art by Brett Blevins. It was subsequently re-released as a three-issue limited series as well. Fasa released three different tabletop games, The Last Starfighter Combat Game, The Last Starfighter Tunnel Chase, and The Last Starfighter Duel in Space. Choose the game to match the degree to which you want to have control over speed, number of enemy fighters, and how long you need to play in order to achieve victory. Despite its appeal to video gamers, there was no official game released for The Last Starfighter, contrary to the callout in the end credits stating, video game available from Atari Incorporated. An arcade version packed with polygons similar to Atari's Star Wars cabinet potentially using the same controller was in development. However, the game was canceled once it was clear that the film wasn't going to be a huge hit. Or even a small hit. The Atari 2600 and Atari 5200 versions were developed, but never released as The Last Starfighter. A PC version would eventually be redesigned, rebranded, and released as Star Raiders 2. The Atari 2600 version was released as Solaris. Six years after it was in theaters, The Last Starfighter was released on the Nintendo Entertainment System, technically a reskin of a game called Uridium, originally developed for the Commodore 64, but hey, it's something. In 2007, the dream finally became reality with the release of Starfighter by Rogue Synapse as an unlicensed PC freeware game. It is a screen-accurate recreation of the arcade game and interface. It uses music and narration from the soundtrack. Rogue Synapse went a step further and created a full-size, fully functional cabinet version of the game after acquiring a reproduction cabinet used in the 1999 documentary Crossing the Frontier, making The Last Starfighter. The cabinet used on the set of the original film had long since been destroyed. Unlike Star Wars, the Last Starfighter never got toys to market. Galoob had developed some very early, very rough prototypes that were essentially just custom pieces made from other existing action figures. Enough to show intent. They even designed packaging that would have sold the figures in pairs, but like the video games, the disappointing performance of the film prompted Galoob to cancel the figures before even getting to final sculpts. The Last Starfighter was a box office disappointment. 1984 was jam-packed with hits like The Karate Kid, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Gremlins, Ghostbusters, Footloose, Beverly Hills Cop, Romancing the Stone, Splash, Purple Rain, Terminator, Breakin'. The Last Starfighter came in at number 26 for the year, just behind Silkwood, just ahead of Places in the Heart. Roger Ebert said, quote, The Last Starfighter is not a terrifically original movie. The video game concept seems inspired by Walt Disney's Tron and the battles in space are such close copies of the Star Wars movies that George Lucas might have a lawsuit. The Last Starfighter is a well-made movie. The special effects are competent. The acting is good, but the final spark was missing. The final burst of inspiration that might have pulled all these concepts and inspirations and retreads together into a good movie. The Last Starfighter was only in theaters for a month, bringing in around $21 million against a budget of $14 million. Hardly the kind of return they were hoping for. Certainly not enough to greenlight the potential trilogy of films that creator Betchul had originally imagined. But the story doesn't end there. Time would give The Last Starfighter another opportunity to cultivate a fan base. Actually, many opportunities over a long time. While it had a short run in theaters, it became a standard on cable television throughout the late 80s and into the 90s. 
consistently rerun, allowing new audiences to find it and take the time to enjoy it, capturing the imaginations of new fans one at a time, a pop culture embrace that was happening all over the world at an individual level. It was released on VHS and Laserdisc in 1985 and then DVD in 1999, a window of nearly two decades before on-demand entertainment existed, before unlimited streaming services and social media, The Last Starfighter flourished. That below-the-radar fandom brought The Last Starfighter places where the filmmakers had not intended back in 1984. In 2004, it was adapted into an off-Broadway show with music by Skip Kennan, directed by Peter Dobbins. You can listen to it today on Spotify. It was released on Blu-ray in 2009, and in October of 2020, Arrow Films produced a special edition 4K restoration that improved the 2009 release with a direct transfer from the original 35mm camera negative. Today, you can watch it on physical media or purchase it digitally from a variety of sites. In 2008, 24 years after its release, the reality of a return to the world created by The Last Starfighter was beginning to crystallize. GPS Entertainment listed Starfighter, the sequel to the classic motion picture The Last Starfighter, as a project that was currently in pre-production. Unfortunately, four years later in 2012, the status had not changed. Not for lack of interest. Seth Rogen, Steven Spielberg, Gary Whitta had all spoken about potentially being involved. The biggest hurdle was trying to figure out who had the rights to what and what it would take to get them. Over the years, as studios had bought and sold each other, expanded, contracted, those rights moved around. Warner Brothers thought they had international distribution. Universal thought they had not only theatrical and home media, but an option to remake the original, while creator Jonathan Betchel was pretty sure he had sequel rights. A report stated in 2015 that Betchel was going to be developing The Last Starfighter as a TV series. However, in 2018, Gary Whitta, the writer of 2016's Rogue One A Star Wars Story, tweeted out some concept art for a project that he was co-writing with Betchel and subsequently tagged Seth Rogen knowing he too was a fan. Whitta would later state in an interview with Gizmodo that what they were working on was, quote, a combination of reboot and sequel that we both think honors the legacy of the original film while passing the torch to a new generation. By October of 2020, a script was well underway and the rights were getting clear, if not potentially probably secured. Witta told moviehole.net that, quote, it looks like we'll be making the deal to get it going. I had to go through a process that took years to recapture the rights, but that was recently completed. And although nothing is ever clear sailing, it looks like we have a really good opportunity now. Definitely a movie, not a TV show. That was someone not speaking on behalf of the production, probably hoping to spur interest and attention. The current project is a feature film with everything that goes with that, incorporating the original characters and concepts, but also not assuming that audiences have seen the original. According to Witta, the story picks up years later with Alex and Maggie grown up. It deals with the next generation and a passing of the joystick and finding out how the whole Star League Codan Empire stuff shook out. Perhaps Lewis has joined the Star League. Perhaps the Star League now includes Earth. While a continuation is closer than ever before, it still seems so far away. The fans have kept the franchise alive, making their own video games, printing their own Gunstar models. Just last year, Lobos Collectibles and Good Guys Never Win Toys released a limited edition of non-posable adult collectible art figures complete with blister cards as they might have appeared if a line was actually released back in 1984. Betchel has said that he always imagined The Last Starfighter as the first part of a trilogy, starting off like Sword in the Stone, then becoming something more like Harry Potter, where the audience gets to follow Alex's adventures as he discovers the world beyond and how dangerous it can be. Though the original film didn't deliver the photorealism that the production had initially hoped to bring to the screen, their efforts were integral in laying the groundwork for the future of movie making. They developed a path to computer-generated effects and helped prepare the audience for what they could expect from the next generation of cinema. It is the movie world we live in today, and it is a production path that they will travel to continue the story, to deliver excitement here close to home and light years away, to take the audience to unexplored galaxies, to inspire you to dream of bigger things, better places, to live with both feet on the ground, but always reaching for the stars. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. Thank you again to KiwiCo for sponsoring this video. If you haven't heard, we started streaming on Twitch. Find us at twitch.tv slash toygalaxy. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon or become a YouTube channel member and let us know in the comments down below if you saw The Last Starfighter in theaters or if you picked it up years later on cable. Definitely cable for me. We had a lot of movies on VHS, but I don't recall ever owning that one. I feel like I've seen it a million times, but absolutely not in the last 20 years until we did 
hated this video. I think it still holds up. The CG is just as good as a lot of the stuff they're trying to pass off still today. I don't watch a lot of movies and think, wow, that was incredibly photorealistic and totally believable. That's for sure. <laughs> God.